Good afternoon. This is Bob Luddy. Uh, welcome to our review of the Great Society, a new history, a definitive history. And we have with us today Amity Schlaes, the author. Um, there you can see a picture of her, and she's also on your screen. Uh, this is a long book, so it's uh, very well researched. And Amity, we're delighted to have you with us today. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I'm a great uh, fan of Bob's and his leadership. So Amity uh, has a number of bestsellers. We'll mention two, The Forgotten Man. Uh, people think of the Great Depression and uh, that era, uh, that we came out of the Great Depression because of government. The Forgotten Man tells another story. Uh, so when you have time, read that book. And very interesting uh, book about Calvin Coolidge, who's probably the most conservative uh, president of the 20th century. Uh, didn't like taxes, uh, man after my own heart. And she wrote a magnificent and definitive book about Calvin Coolidge. And for those of you who don't know, Amity is the chair of the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation based in Vermont. It also has a uh, location uh, in our capital. Um, so you should become more familiar with the um, Coolidge Foundation because you can read the speeches of Coolidge, which he was a very erudite individual unlike modern politicians. Uh, for those of you who are troubled with her name, we uh, spelled out for you, Schles. So, um, and here's an interesting comment from the book. So there was a scant uh, difference between the two presidents, Lyndon Johnson and Nixon. We tend to think of the next president as our Superman and everything's gonna change if we just elect a president um, she enlightens us to what really happens. Uh, the, the Great Society also sketches moving portraits of the characters involved from Reagan to one of her favorite characters that Emily knows a lot about, Arthur Burns, uh, the master of inflation. Uh, but also she um, talks about business leaders from Intel that was in their prime at that time and the big three. Um, she somewhat upends the narratives that we hear. So we, we hear little comments, and I'm, I'm going to bring up one later from the Washington Post. Uh, and we tend to think, well, unions create jobs, right? No, that's not right. Uh, if we look through the Midwest, we've lost thousands and millions of jobs over a period of time. So she enlightens us to the reality of what goes on, not what the myth is. Um, government domestic spending prior to the Great Society was relatively low. As a matter of fact, if you think back of what the federal budget was in 1960, it's shocking compared to now. I think it was $300 million. It seems like a trivial expense relative to modern times. Essentially, uh, the Great Society, in my view, transformed the way government operates, not in a positive way, but in a very negative way, where everybody is more reliant on the government. This is a specialty of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson, and now President Joe Biden wants to go this same path uh, that we know is not going to get us anywhere. So we'll move on, uh, and maybe <laughs> Amity can tell us why did why did you use bonanza as an analogy in this book? Well, thank you, Bob. Um, Bonanza was a popular TV show uh, on the entire 60s. And uh, it, it was about um, cowboys, but it was a different cowboy show because the Bonanza family were already rich. They had a Bonanza, they'd succeeded. Uh, and they were the Cartwrights. If you ever hear of them, that was the fictional family. They, they had wealth. So the real question of Bonanza was, how do you be a good person once you have wealth or be a good gov government, right? And that was essentially the question America was asking itself, Bob, at the beginning of the 60s. We're rich, what do we do with the money? Are we good people? Uh, do we help our neighbor? Do we buy something for an orphan? Do we build a school? 
What do we do with it? So the metaphor just uh, played out. And I like that because uh, the assumption was very similar, Bob, to one we have today, which is we're rich. The money will always be there. It just comes. It's a bonanza. It's automatic. Uh, and of course, that didn't entirely prove the case. But, but very much like now, oh, given colon money, what should we do? The money was the given, the strong economy. Amity, mean, in some cases, like the prude, I go, okay, so we did this 50 years ago, made a big mistake, but we're still doing it. <laughs> right. So maybe you could explain why there's no learning curve in government. Hmm. Maybe we're doing it even worse. We're certainly spending a lot more money to get less done now than we did back then. And in other well, cases- um, One of the things about housing is now people get rent subsidies. I think yeah. through section eight. It's just exploded uh, into more bad ideas. Then and, and that can work, except people get a, a, accustomed to having subsidies and they raise their families that way. Um, and then you have the case of uh, you call it the creative society. What why does people hate the creative productive society? I mean, this is the basis of America. So what why do we have this large number of people that just hate everybody that's not going to work every day and producing and um, and creating wealth, which they want to take away and do things they'd like to do with. Right. That's all it comes down to. You might also comment, I, I never heard any clamoring in 1965 for the Great Society. So in my mind, it's not what the people wanted. It may have been what 5% of the people wanted. But nobody I knew in, in our family, we, we wouldn't have taken great society money if they gave it to us. But you know, one thing you should might consider asking Bob is why did Lyndon Johnson want to do it? And one reason is um, he liked to, everyone likes to do what he does best. And the thing he did best was pass laws. But another thing was he was very envious of the Kennedy family and their intellectual entourage. And he was trying to respect their geniuses uh, and hire them and give them jobs. And uh, so instead of listening to his own common sense, he aped the worst part of the intellectuals. That's an assumption that he had any common sense. Oh, he had common sense. I mean, I just, I just think he was 100% political and ego, you know. Uh, I mean, and I guess I'm contradicting myself, but you know, um, he had common sense. It's just his ego overwhelmed it. Now, one of the uh, comments from the editorial or was a book review in the Washington Post was you didn't really prove the case. Uh, I thought it was so overwhelming. So how do you answer these critics? Oh, yeah, well, you're you're slipping something in that's not in the slides. I didn't understand that review, particularly as it came from the Niskanen Center. And Mr. Niskanen himself was a wonderful man and really had uh, very similar critiques to my book uh, of the Great Society. Um, you know, sometimes the right wing, it's supposed to be more of a right wing critique. The right wing is strange nowadays. I, I found, I was glad to get a review, but found the criticism strange. What, I, what I'm recalling, uh, what the author said was, I didn't cover Medicare. Medicare was a program in great society. And nowadays, if you look at the budget, you see it's very expensive. Uh, so it's important, you know, that was a new program in the great society period, the 1960s. So um, the reviewers uh, raising this issue wasn't wrong, except for this reason. When Lyndon Johnson signed Medicare, which is healthcare for seniors plus, plus, plus nowadays, into law, he didn't really think about it. It was kind of an incidental. Uh, it was part of some reform of social security, some expansion of benefits. Um, he didn't think, now I will create an entitlement that will cost our grandchildren even more than social security, which my mentor Franklin Roosevelt created, and will bust the government, which it's said to do. It, it was just one of those things on a busy, you know, in a busy week. And my point, I didn't want to go ahead in time. By the way, they also created Medicaid. I didn't want to go ahead in time and say, and by the way, the consequences of this were unexpected and great. 
because the book was about then. What I wanted to capture is how you can make great mistakes through cavalier actions without any awareness of the consequences 50 years hence. So had I spelled out what happened in Medicare forever, I would have jumped out of my narrative into present day. And I was trying to capture what they thought, not what I thought. Excellent oh, no. point. Can I ask you a question on these programs? So people might look at them and say, well, everybody getting medical care, that's a good thing. But if you look at every one of these, particularly in the area of medicine and education, we would say, but at what cost? But at what cost? I like the pen picture you came up with too. That's very nice. <laughs> um, let's talk about some of these items. I think the real problem, there are two problems with Medicare and Medicaid. One is they'll bankrupt our grandchildren. Uh, actually three. Two is they'll lead to socialized medicine for all and, and rationing. But three is they accustomed Americans to think the government should be always in charge of health and um, that health uh, justifies a great state. And in the recent COVID discussion and, and policy, I was disappointed in the way families look so much to government and believe government when government was erratic, even though this disease is clearly formidable. And I do think, Bob, that comes out of the Medicare Medicaid tradition. So it wasn't just the cost of these programs, it was the assumptions they led us to have. If Friedrich Hayek, the great free marketeer, um, were writing the road, to, he wrote the road to serfdom about how incremental expansions of government often led by a, a wartime spending lead to socialism. If, if he'd written that today, I think you could make the argument that you don't need the war, you just need a pandemic to flip America into a more socialist into an, an inexorable uh, socialism, socializing path. So, so Medicare and Medicaid mattered a lot because the precedent they set and the culture they created. Um, let's just talk a little bit more about some of these Head Start. I grew up in the period of Head Start. It's nursery school. I thought this isn't so bad. Why do people get so exercised about Head Start? What can be wrong with nursery school? Um, in, in the research for the book, I, under, I began to understand the opponents, no, not, though not necessarily agree with them. What they were afraid of was that Head Start would be the beginning of government running the federal government as opposed to towns and states running all schools. Uh, they didn't like the idea of the federal government being in charge of schools. Uh, so that was a good, uh, a good proportion of the dislike of Head Start uh, in the 60s. Um, another thing I want to mention is public broadcasting, which I did give short shrift in the book. I probably should have done some more because now we live in public radio land and there's not enough uh, uh, alternate. There are two, there's not an alternate to public radio in the same way. Um, there's not radio of the standing of public radio. And it shapes our culture in every area from foreign policy to political selection to, of course, discussion of COVID or say inflation now. So I, I probably, that sounded like a nice pleasant program. I probably should have given more attention to that. It turned out to be very, very influential because of course public radio is not um, sufficiently balanced. Would you say public radio is essentially an arm of the government? It's the propaganda of the government. It's not propaganda of the government, but it supports basic government arguments most of the time. It's sort of, um, there's a thing called Overton's window, which is the window of what's socially acceptable and it gets moved left and right. And what public radio do, does is says, well, that's outside the acceptability window. It's outside of the salon. We won't even, we'll cancel that. We'll keep it out because it's extreme, including for example, often the argument for school vouchers. Um, that's not an extreme idea, um, but we've been trained through public radio. And the reason public radio does that is because um, many universities think that, as public radio does, but also because public radio is funded by government. And so uh, it's not going to be hostile to policies or culture the government tends to support. Interesting. So do we go back to our slides? <laughs> Government spending, are you going to address this issue? Yes, I am. What, what, okay, so imagine a period where 
we decided to spend a whole lot more because we were good hearted people. And again, we had a bonanza. That was the spending. Uh, and the idea was the Vietnam was Vietnam War was on and ramped up very quickly. And Bob will recall this. We went from very few men in Vietnam to 500,000 within a year or two. Is that correct, Bob? That's correct. And that's West a lot Maryland. of men. That's a lot of soldiers all of a sudden over there. And the idea was let's spend at home because we should, because we're good people, because we're rich. But also the, the quiet equation was to make up for Vietnam. And the spending we spend at home will never be anything like what we spend on wars. Uh, but what was interesting to me, and in the back of this book, I have some charts which Chairman Greenspan uh, helped me make, the Fed chairman, uh, he was very magnanimous, former Fed chairman, uh, and the Hoover Institution helped me make the show that pretty soon our domestic spending, what we call entitlements, outpaced our war spending as it does today. Yeah, um, it's a myth that war spending is bigger than domestic spending and has been a myth for a long time. So you see the ramp up here and we talk about trillions. They were talking about billions. Well, the continents at the beginning of the word, uh, they switch million, billion, trillion, but the illion is the problem. It, it, you know, bigger and bigger, more and more illions. Now we're at trillions. Um, and here is the spending, and we actually sort of couldn't afford the spending. Um, another shift that's important, Bob, about, about the 60s, we didn't talk about entitlements, use that word, we're entitled, um, up until the 60s. And in specific, I have a look at a case called Goldberg v. Kelly, where the Supreme Court decided uh, that people needed more due process when it came to getting entitlements, particularly welfare. And that in, and they sketched out this notion that entitlements were property, just like your house is your property or your share in a company is property, or your car once, if you don't lease it, is property. That was a new idea, entitled. You're entitled to it and you own it. And we think of that as being forever since what the, the America was founded. It wasn't. The welfare was something you got if government decided you should. And that was sometimes fairly obnoxious. A social worker lady says you don't get the money or you do. And it's up to her and her mood on this afternoon. Um, but it was also important because it gave government a way to limit uh, entitlements. Once you were entitled to your entitlement, well, it, it creates a trend, right? Uh, and it, it, you think of it as your property. Um, and I, I had a young lady in a school in Arizona, maybe a high schooler, get up and say, you're talking about food stamps and entitlement, and you're shaming me, I get food stamps. No, we all agree that at certain points people come to want and maybe they should get food stamps. We don't want people to be hungry, but I think we can all agree and certainly most, I would surmise most uh, food stamp recipients agree that it, it's not a shame to get food stamps, but what is a shame, there's no shame in that, is to, to be sure that not only you, but also your children and grandchildren will get food stamps. Nobody wants their grandchildren to need food stamps. So they want, uh, so that's where we are now. It's become a, an enshackling vicious, vicious cycle. So we're, we're now moving into phase three. So um, build back better, which is another major extension of welfare state. Is there any way to get away from this uh, massive government growth and entitlements? based on um, your research? Yes, well, so you have the New Deal, which was the 30s, that's when Lyndon Johnson grew up, his mentor was Franklin Roosevelt, and then you have the next progressive impulse, which is Great Society, and now Bob is saying, we're in stage three, certainly looks like that, because again, we're talking uh, the same way and with the same idealism. Nobody says it's wrong to be idealistic, but, and we're talking just that way, we just have to be pretty honest about the results. Um, yeah, we're moving into it. And I do think there's something that can stop it. And it's not going to be um, a shift to virtue on the part of lawmakers we elect. It'll probably be a currency crisis where we run out of money. Um, that was a bit what happened with Ronald Reagan. It's certainly what happened in the United Kingdom with Margaret Thatcher. Not, uh, in the early 60s, England wasn't ready to say we're going to 
um, elect a, a strong-willed lady who's a little bit scary, the Iron Lady, Mrs. Thatcher, who once England fell, the UK fell into financial trouble, they needed someone who had the capacity to be tough about spending, and they elected Mrs. Thatcher. Some exogenous event will hit us over the head, probably relating to the dollar and interest rates, and uh, it will stop the progressive impulse because the government won't have the money to pay for the progressivism. I say that with a little bit of sorrow because it's a brutal experience. So essentially, we need a crisis to improve. Yeah, crises cause expansion of government, but they can also cause a uh, contraction of government. You made it uh, the beginning of the case that defense spending is not what breaks the budget because most people think defense spending is half the budget. I don't know what they think, but there's a general belief that defense spending is overwhelming. And if we just took care of that problem, the federal budget would be fine. Well, one of the things we do at the Luddy schools uh, and in our debate is talk about this. I, it's, it's fairly clear why people are easily misled. You hear about discretionary spending and you hear about uh, mandatory spending and you're all confused. Um, and then they say uh, defense is a big part of discretionary spending and you forget about the discretionary and you think defense is a big part of spending. Discretionary gets smaller and smaller. It happens, defense, which doesn't sound like it falls into discretionary category. But mandatory spending is bigger and has been for a long time. That's entitlements. Again, that concept mandatory. So that's where people get the fallacy. And if your children have high school homework, show them the discretionary mandatory pie. It's right in the government papers or email um, Bob staff, uh, and that's in Coolidge material because we have kids debate that at the Levy School so they can see, um, you know, there's sort of a, a little misrepresentation to the story. Defense spending does not break the budget. In fact, as a share of our economy, we spend less on defense than we did um, at other periods now. Can you talk a little bit about uh, government spending and inflation and also crowding out the private sector? Well, um, it, it was sort of like now uh, they were talking about what supply chain, um, spot shortages in certain commodities. Well, it's just a shortage or labor shortage. And what it turned out was they had inflation in the 60s and 70s, particularly uh, going into the 70s, and they didn't want to acknowledge it. Nobody wants to acknowledge inflation. No one, nobody wants to acknowledge, think about yourself as a hiring boss. Well, uh, I don't want to pass a 35% increase onto my customer. I had this conversation actually with the man who puts our docks in at, 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 at our little lake place and uh we said uh we're we're getting all we can put the dock in uh when are you coming to put the dock in well i don't know if i can uh and uh we said why and he said short supply of labor and we said what if we pay a little more because we kind of want the dock in because we're here to swim at the lake and he said well i would have to charge you 35 percent more because i'd have to pay people 35 percent more and uh, I'm not sure my customers are ready for that. So he's kind of pausing and saying he had a labor supply before he bit the bullet and hiked his prices 35%. And of course, in, in, in Captivare's world or in your world, viewers, that's all over the place. There's a pause before you hike a price 30 or 35%, right? Um, but that's often what we're talking about because nobody wants to acknowledge inflation. Uh, but it comes and it's already there. We're just in the process of acknowledging it when the government creates a lot of money, just put it that way. It's interesting that the people on the street, the common people can see and they know there's inflation when it's denied by the government. What, what does that do about people's long-term impact of trusting the government? Well, money is about trust. And so you wanna think about the Bitcoin or the Dogecoin or the Shiba Inu or any other cryptocurrencies or any other product like that. What, what you know you can rank them as to whether there's any reality to them and how much and where uh, and there is some reality to some of them but what they are first and foremost is a measure of distrust in the federal government people are looking for other monies because they're kind of suspecting that the dollar won't be what it 
they hope it is in the future. That's all it is. Does this, uh, Prude, I go, does, does this kind of waste come from the fact that this money's allocated and we have to spend it, so let's just do something. We'll build this massive housing project then in 20 years is going to be blown up. I mean, it's, it's, it's so shocking when you look at this slide. What are your thoughts on it? Well, I, I put this in the book, even though Pruitt Igo started in the 50s, as you can see, um, because the Great Society impulse, the actual technical Great Society was the 60s under Lyndon Johnson, but there are many periods in our history when we want to be great and we're not happy with good. Um, and this came out of that impulse. There was a simple premise. There wasn't enough housing in St. Louis. The African-American population in particular had dumpy housing and deserved better, definitely. Um, and uh, well, the government would come along and create a few authorities. There were a lot of levels of government. The, the St. Louis Housing Authority, which is different from HUD, the Federal Housing Authority, which we created, you know, on and on layers of authorities will we'll create housing. And you see there are, I believe there were 33 towers, 11 stories each, and people will live in them like gods. And the architect who my father knew was named Yamasaki. And he was a nice man. My father said, don't be too mean about Yamasaki. Uh, but he had to compromise his buildings and he was a European style visionary. You can see that looks like, um, Mies van der Rohe or, you know, or Corbusier, the European architects, and he built these, and the premise was once they got going, they would be self-sustaining because they're so dense, their apartments, and we'd get enough revenue from the rent, and we'd put in more people, so if they paid less, it wouldn't matter too much, and they'd run themselves, and the, again, that was the premise, the bonanza that St. Louis would always continue to grow. Well, St. Louis didn't continue to grow. It had nothing to do with race. It had more to do with unions and the expense of employment in Missouri. And so these buildings were never full. And so they couldn't be maintained. The arithmetic and the spreadsheets and the business plan did not work. And also, you know, there were other flaws which have been much discussed. The reason this, this housing project Project is important because it's, it's the biggest in American history, and it was open with such love in St. Louis. Um, and it fell apart for other reasons. Uh, you know, um, fathers weren't allowed to live there because welfare only went to mothers who were single. So families were rough, and and boys didn't have models, and sometimes they misbehaved. Okay. And uh, but it, uh, and also it was a sort of center of hopelessness because the people didn't own, they rented. And it was what we call a tragedy of the commons. I like that quote at the bottom very much. It, it, it's from one of the managers of Pruitt Igo. And they couldn't keep up with the maintenance there. There was a lot of graffiti. There was a lot of vandalism because uh, the people were unhopeful, but they also couldn't keep up with the maintenance because they didn't have enough money, the management to do the maintenance. And he, he, the manager explained the vicious cycle. He said, if you don't paint them, the walls, the people who then may have a tendency to treat you with the same respect you treat them, which is less respect because you house them like, you know, it's a transitive verb, housing people. It's a little demeaning. Well, people really actually want to house themselves. It's, uh, and that was what was wrong with the policy as well. People were treated like, um, uh, they were infantilized by the project. They didn't have an opportunity to build for themselves. That's the salient point. They want to house themselves. They want a sense of independence, which is all taken away from them. If we move to the next, oh, well, here's a, here's a good example. What can you tell us about Father Shockley? And well, his I never heard of him. And there's a movie about Pruitt Igo because it is an example of what's wrong with public housing. And I recommend it to every high school teacher. It's called The Myth of Pruitt Igo. I often show it in my history courses at colleges or in business school. Um, so Father Shockley, I encountered him. I didn't know about him when I was writing about, I, I went to study Pruitt Igo a bit and I encountered him. There was one church, that, or this was a place where everything was raised by big bulldozers in the 1950s to eminent domain, but they happened to leave one church standing. It was St. Bridget's. And Father Shockley was the parish priest at St. Bridget's. He was also from St. Louis. He attended a, uh, a, a Christian high school, I believe it's Jesuit high school, and a lot of other people went there too, apparently. It's a very fine high school. Uh, and so he was of the neighborhood, and he figured out that people didn't like living in this big complex. 
uh, they wanted their own house. And he started a little neighborhood rebuilding program, basically sweat equity. And he found a congresswoman to work with and maybe they got a little money and people began to be able to uh, buy a house that what had been considered too far gone to be worth rebuilding. The people moved into the houses. They were very proud, proud and they rebuilt them over the weekend, just the way you do. So Father Shockley understood the individual soul. He understood that man has a soul and a man or woman needs autonomy to grow and that when he's housed transitive verb you know you, you take away his autonomy and a little bit of his soul so I kind of came to like him he was he became, I think he became a monsignor he rose and rose in the church he was a legend in Missouri and a number of people have written me who knew Father Shockley after uh, I he had this cameo in my book I wish he were still alive so I could meet him you know, that's a story that's never told. Uh, you know, we can see the housing project. Uh, so let's, let's move on to uh, the real job creators, the creative society, and talk about how it's crowded out uh, by the great society. One of the stories I was, I, I was uh, at pains to tell in the 60s was the story of the private sector, because everyone, I mean, essentially a great society, or even now, we make a choice. We say, we want a great society. Who's going to do it? Well, the public sector is going to do it. The government's going to do it. The private sector won't do it. The private sector is the bonanza that will pay for it, right? Um, the That was the attitude in the 60s. And so what I did was I covered um, a company called Fairchild that eventually the, the fellows who worked there became Intel. They invented microchips, basically, or they made them possible. They commercialized them and they gave us a lot of, excuse me, a lot of what is important to us in our lives today, phones, computers, everything. Uh, and they also created a lot of jobs. Even in the US, um, the Intel fellows who were then at Fairchild actually um, started a factory on a Native American plantation of the Navajo in New Mexico in Shiprock, where they became the greatest single private sector employer of Native Americans. The Native Americans were very good at needlework in that part of the country, and that relates to the work uh, of microchips under, under a magnifying glass. And um, what that little tiny story of one factory of Fairchild slash what became Intel um, what is is a microcosm of what the private sector did for uh, lower earners or people just entering the economy going from uh, entry level to some kind of skilled work, which is to say more than we expected. Uh, could, and could we contrast that, uh, contrast that with what's happening now that Intel does not have the fabs that we need. We're critically short of semiconductors. So you made the case that they powered America but also we know now in real time when those organizations aren't powering America, it, it makes everything very difficult. Yes. And I, I, I'll, yes, I talked a little bit about Toyota too, because um, one of the surprises to me in this book was the role of the labor unions. Um, as a child, I grew up hearing about the United Auto Workers on TV every night. And so did, so did you, Bob, where they would say, and John L. Lewis, or Walter Ruther of the United Auto Workers said, and then GE, or in this case would be GM Ford Chrysler said, Walter Ruther said, Henry Ford said. But what I began to realize in this book was that the unions did do terrible damage because they priced the US auto out of the market. And that's sad, the US auto was priced out. But they also, in the process, with the collusion of Henry Ford, who was kind of naive, killed uh, Detroit or Flint. Uh, again, as with St. Louis, part of that story is the city didn't grow as we expected because the product it made wasn't competitive. What does that have to do with the unions? The unions made the labor too expensive. So we like the idea of unions, but often they kill jobs. And that's one thing I learned. The companies that were able to innovate successfully were less unionized or somewhere else. Uh, Toyota has unions um, and did have unions, but they weren't the tigers that our unions are. And uh, I had a good look into lean and that philosophy of, of factory management, of, of production, of innovation. 
Um, and what was paradoxical is you think of uh, Japan in those days as a very docile ordered society, but on the assembly line at Toyota, the worker, again, getting back to individual autonomy, had more autonomy than in the American Union assembly line. You know, in the, today we're seeing evidence of uh, government crowding out uh, business. So we don't have the labor we need. We don't have the parts we need. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? So in real time, I think people can understand this. Oh, well, yes. Um, I mean, it, it, generally government takes labor and it takes the culture uh, and sometimes it takes the parts. Um, the, I don't technically know how you'd explain the crowding out. What I saw in that chart on the preceding page is um, everyone expected the the Dow Jones Industrial Average to always go up. That's what we expect now, right? Uh, you know, well, it's at 36,000. Well, maybe in five years, we're doing our planning. It'll be 40,000 just about time when we need the money for our child's college. And that is, we expect that sort of as our birthright. But you'll see here that the Dow was flat for a generation. And uh, you might pick S&P now or another index, NASDAQ or um, the Dow was the best proxy uh, at the time. It was really flat. And that's even, um, I mean, this is, is a nominal. If when you include inflation, it was even lower, of course, because they had lots of inflation. So our, the birth rate went away and the Dow was flat for many, many years. I mean, what if we waited, uh, said, well, the Dow uh, markets won't go up for 25 years. We'd all have a different attitude when we get up in the morning, right? Um, that's what happened as a result of the inflation and the government crowding out. Uh, just what is the real impact of the uh, Great Society? Um, are we headed back to stagflation with phase three of, of the Great Society? It's very dangerous to pause it because I'm one of those people who thought inflation was coming in 2010. Uh, uh, I'd still think it was there, it just was unquantified. But anyway, but it, the recipe of the 60s gave us thing called stagflation, which economists didn't even think was possible, a combination of high unemployment and high inflation. Uh, and yes, that is possible now. But, you know, we might, what is the nuance? We might have underemployment because a lot of people just aren't part of the workforce. They don't want to be part of the workforce. They don't see why they should train up. And that's very tragic. So maybe we'll quantify unemployment um, more rigorously to include underemployment more precisely. But yes, uh, and I, I do believe un, uh, inflation is stronger than we allow and will become yet stronger. Are universities and unions and government just sort of permanent adversaries of the free market? I don't think universities are. Uh, universities are just sort of, uh, they can be, but they're not always. Uh, I, I've come to think that um, public sector unions are particularly bad. Calvin Coolidge knew that. Um, he was inspired Ronald Reagan, in, in fact, because he said there's no right to strike against the public safety. There's just an inherent conflict between being a public sector servant and being in a union. Uh, Coolidge understood that, Reagan understood it, it's bitter. We all want the people we know who give their service to government to be well paid and have retirement. But when uh, people unionize, particularly in the public sector, that bankrupt states is the proximate problem now, or it leads to poor education as you often see in public schools where the schools become more, uh, exist more to provide jobs to teachers than to help students. And I say this is someone who really loves teachers, including public school teachers, uh, but there needs to be more competition in the school world so we can see the limits of public schools and teachers themselves can have more choice in where they work and how they teach. You're familiar with the principle of subordination. And in this case, they did the exact opposite. It's all centralized. See, they, they don't take in consideration the mayors who know the city's best. They not only crowded out uh, business, but also uh, local government. Can you comment on that? Well, yes. I mean, imagine yourself when you go to the DMV and they say, 
or you go to get a permit. DMV is an oversimple example, but I'll give it anyway. And they say, oh no, wait a minute, you have to go to the health department and get that. And oh no, you have to get that. Um, and you're caught among and between jurisdictions. And that's a certain kind of hell. It's the same with regulation. You're getting a permit for this and then you get to the end of the line, they say you have to get a permit for that. And it's the multiple jurisdictions that happened a lot with the Great Society um, for mayors. It, a, a big government person from Washington would come and say, we're going to give you a million dollars. And the mayor would say, great. Uh, but he wouldn't be in charge of the money. And the federal government wasn't quite in charge of the money. In the St. Louis Housing Authority, to give an example, wasn't quite in charge of the money. Nobody was in charge of the money. It's just a bunch of people um, fighting over jurisdiction. Uh, and this is very frustrating to mayors. I recommend uh, highly a website called Strong Towns, which is not necessarily all free market, but what Strong Towns says, uh, it's one of the few websites I subscribe to as a paying subscriber. Uh, and it is a town gets addicted to big government money and it feels good because then the town can say to its constituents, we don't have to tax you because we have government money from Washington. We have payroll protection or whatever, but it feels bad too, because then the town becomes in, uh, dependent on the money. And also more importantly, it builds things its own constituents don't really want, or it doesn't want bad highways to nowhere, ripping up neighborhoods, wrong houses. Uh, and that's what happened with the great society. The mayors lost their authority and their control of their cities. Nobody was in control of the cities. It was a tragedy of the commons. And it's played out that way. Can you talk a little bit about the impact of the Great Society on the gold standard and the dollar? Well, yes. I mean, we had to have, to put it very childishly, a certain amount of gold against our dollars. So if X dollars outstanding. We had to have 25 or 30% gold in the bank because we had a gold-backed dollar in that system. And when governments wanted to, they could collect gold and they were feeling skeptical, just as Bitcoin buyers might be today. Well, um, what did I learn in looking into this, which I didn't know that much about it? They had a coin shortage. That sounds familiar, right? First, because uh, and then second, governments were withdrawing their gold and we were getting to this close to the statutory limit of how much gold we were allowed to give out. We had to have, I think it was 25. I'm sorry, I, I should remember that, maybe 20% uh, uh, gold. So what did we do? Um, we didn't you know, strengthen the dollar. What we did was we passed a law that said we don't have to have those gold reserves anymore. And then we got rid of the metric. So people couldn't even know about what was the alarming metric. Uh, so um, the, it, what, and it was hilarious when I went back to look at the Wall Street Journal, which always showed how much gold the government had relative to currency outstanding in a chart on page C3 or something. One week they had the, the, the ratio and the next week they had the name of the ratio, but no number. And the week after that, the data point just disappeared. You couldn't look up how much gold the government had relative to the dollars. That's Soviet. You know, if you don't like a number, make it go away, right? If you don't like an index, make it go away. And I found that hilarious and creepy when I discovered that in the research for this book. And then, of course, technically and publicly, we went off our gold standard um, in 1971, right? 71. Richard Nixon did that August 71. Um, at Camp David uh, with a big sort of uh, populist stimulus plan. He also went off the gold standard more formally. He, of course, he said it was temporary, but he said we were, quote unquote, closing the gold window. And after that, the inflation was inevitable. Now, we know that the dollar is a fiat currency. It means it has no backing. Are people who are enamored with Bitcoin and these other currencies, are they saying, well, we trust Bitcoin more than we trust the dollar? Is that the message? A little bit. I mean, no, what they're saying is I'm hedging. We trust the dollar less than we formerly have done. And now we have the technological ability to hedge. You know, it would have been hard to have a Bitcoin in the period before computers, which is the 60s. You know, regular people didn't have computers yet, though Intel would bring those. Um, 
now we have the technology, we have the international knowledge, and we have the skepticism. So it may not be Bitcoin. I, I, I kind of said it before. I think that's the best way to say it is these new currencies may not be perfect. Some may, you may have your opinions or they may be good or nothing or a lot, but they are definitely a measure, uh, uh, a metric of our, our skepticism about the dollar. Are we currently at a point in time where people maybe generally know these programs don't work very well, but they say, well, at least we're trying to do something about it. Uh, no real rational evaluation of the great society or build back better or et cetera. Well, nothing is new. It's just forgotten, right? Uh, the cycle repeats itself. So we've reached a point where people don't remember the great society. So they kind of have a bad feeling about it because you notice President Biden didn't say, I want to build a great society quite that way, though he's referenced Johnson. He said, I want to be like Franklin Roosevelt because that's really sufficiently far away, Franklin Roosevelt, that nobody remembers the economic result. <laughs> there's, there's a little bit of memory of great society, but not much. Uh, and what I noticed, and I recommend John Kogan's book about, great, about uh, the history of entitlements, so high cost of good intentions. Um, it, 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 the, the impulse is a lovable one. People want to do things for people. The, the problem is the results when when the collective does the work, when the government does the work, aren't where we um, want them to be. Hope is not a result, so it can't be a policy. Wait a minute, this has been a delightful review. We're going to close by showing some pictures out of your books, and you can, you're welcome to make any comments you like. Well, I like the picture on the left at the top because that's Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who's sort of like a character from Shakespeare's maybe um, the chorus in, in a Greek play or the, the, the tragic clown or the genius, all those. He was a figure who walked through the 60s, served Democrats and Republicans, was really bright and lived his own mistakes in real time. And a lot of his mistakes were serious. He helped craft our public sector union policy in Executive Order 10988, which is the beginning of public sector unions in a strong way. But he's also um, interesting because he, he, he knew often what he did was wrong. So here he is talking to Nixon. And one of the revisions of my book is that Nixon wanted to expand the Great Society. Uh, Republicans, as you, you notice, weren't that different. Below that is a ticket to um, the University of Michigan speech where Johnson announced the Great Society, where he said, we're going to do everything, uh, he said, great, he didn't say good. There's pruitt Igo uh, at the beginning and you can see what the bulldozer rot. Um, as a kid, I remember playing in those uh, bulldozed lots that weren't yet planted and sometimes nothing ever grew there, uh, right? And uh, uh, I don't think poverty rates have plummeted. I, I, um, I'm not sure I agree with the, the sentence at the top of this chart. Uh, poverty has stabilized. It, you could say they've plummeted. Uh, the full income poverty measure means people are poor, but they get what they need to eat. So are they, or they get cars or they get a subsidy. That is definitely true because the entitlement um, situation. But if you're not coming out of poverty, well, then you're just trapped in it, even though you get all these payments and this support, uh, um, which is never enough for your soul, right? The official poverty rate, I like better. Um, uh, and uh, as a measure, which is how poor are you when you, you know how much you real, how much you earning and so on, uh, and that's what's interesting is after trillions spent on poverty, we still have about the same poverty we had um, in the middle of the Great Society. The the decline in the rate of poverty was faster before the Great Society. You can see the beginning of the sixties. That's before the Great Society we were getting out of poverty at a faster rate. And that was because of economic growth um, without the crowding out effect to the public sector. Does that make sense? Any final comments on this slide? Well, the one you wanna look at is the sad demolition of pruitt Igo, because there it is. And, um, you know, we say we're going to be great. In the end, all we, we were focused on was being great at blowing up what we wrought, but a tragic end. 
and there they were. The, the company that did that demolition did a very good job, state-of-the-art demolition. It was called Plan Demolition. It's from Maryland. The name of the guy who did it was Mark Wazo. He was the world's greatest detonator planner. He was a young man at the time, and he, he wanted to do it so the buildings imploded on themselves. But it was one of the most tragic events ever. We had built these buildings about a generation before, and in the 70s, we brought them down. That was our experiment. And people had lived there, uh, and mostly unhappily. Um, so there you are. Uh, there's the Bonanza. They look happy. They've got their teeth like their horse. There's President Kennedy who started some of this, uh, and particularly Robert Kennedy, though, was responsible for the beginnings of the Great Society. Well, John Kennedy did realize that lower taxes uh, help the creative society, so we can give him that much credit. But well, it's been very delightful to be with you. Uh, we see these final pictures of the two men that promoted the uh, Great Society, mm -hmm. and we're going to ask for uh, questions, which we will answer later because we have timed out. I appreciate you being here. Have a good evening.